Sabbath blessings, brothers and sisters. If we can kneel, let's begin in prayer. And lift holy hands. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together once again on this Sabbath day. Please, Father, may our love grow for you. May our love grow for Christ. May our love grow also for each other and for all of those in the world who are lost. May a zeal be kindled within us, Father, that same zeal that was kindled within the apostles. For we know that a pattern has been shown to us, and that pattern was given by Christ and the apostolic church and none other. And we are to be zealous as they, as your early church was, Father, if we are to finish this work. And we pray, Father, that we will receive that latter rain and that you will pour out this rain upon us so that we can finish this work. We also pray, Father, for all those in our hearts and minds on our prayer list, especially those that are lost, that you bless them, Father, and help us, Father, to overcome all the, sin, all the sins that so easily beset us as well. Give us an understanding of the word today, Father. Thank you for changing the showbread, and please bridle my tongue and any tongue that shall speak in your behalf and help, uh, help me, Father, to um, preach this message with faith. And I pray that... Um, your Holy Spirit moves this day. And we uplift and pray this prayer in the name of your Son, our Saviour and King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen and amen. Okay. So, today, for today, we're actually going to take a break from the uh, sanctuary service. So, the Lord actually gave me a sermon um two actually was one was last nearly two weeks ago and then i was gonna um preach that one today but then something else was on my mind and um i felt like uh that was needed to be preached today so that's what we'll look into today and so and we will go back to the sanctuary uh, the study of the sanctuary. It's just that I felt this on my heart to share today. So, I guess as well because I've been obviously in Revelation and I've been reading about the study of the seven churches and it's come to my attention and also the attention of other you know, brothers in the faith that um, the lukewarm state that the laodicean church and you have the philadelphian church and if you do a study into it you see that the in today's world we as christians will either be in that laodicean church or as sabbath keeping christians i should say we'll either be in that laodicean church or in the philadelphian state of mind and we want to be in that philadelphian state and not the laodicean and um i think tonight i'm going to put together a study uh on the seven churches and so yeah i'll have i'll have a study on the seven, like on all seven churches which will make that more um easy to understand i guess but today we're just going to focus on the layered to see state as you can see the title of the sermon is hot cold or lukewarm so uh, current slide let me just get my phone okay So, in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 17, here we read the message that Jesus Christ gives to the Laodicean church, the, the seventh church. And he says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So in other words, I would rather that you were cold rather than be lukewarm. I would rather that you were hot rather than be lukewarm. And then verse 16 he says, So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. 
Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now it's the state of this church that we as Sabbath keeping Christians in these last days have to be careful that we do not fall into this state. And if we have already fallen uh, into the state to repent and to come out of the state, because my understanding beforehand, right, when I would read about, you know, lukewarm, I would just, I would just um, appropriate that to Sunday keeping Christians, the Sunday keeping churches. Oh, yeah, they're lukewarm. They're lukewarm churches. Which, in other words, I'm saying that we as Sabbath keepers, we are, the, we are hot. We're on fire. We're on fire for the Lord. We're keeping the Sabbath, right? But if you really, really look into it, the Sunday keeping churches, as we'll see from the study, are not lukewarm. They're cold. They're cold. <laughs> So then it, it's on to the Sabbath keeping Christians in these last days, whether or not we are going to be hot or lukewarm. So here's an example of, so essentially I'm going to give an example of hot, an example of cold, and then we're going to ask ourselves, then what's lukewarm in this case? So when it comes to prayer, it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So we are told by God to pray always for all saints. So that's our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have to remember that, that um, part of the unity of the church is that we pray for one another. Even if we can't, even if we're miles away from each other and we can't meet up in person, or we can't even... Um, you know, we don't even uh, call each other up. We can at least, apart from Sabbath, of course, we all meet, right? We can at least pray for one another and keep each other in prayer. And so in Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, we read, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And in Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 we read, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So here we see some examples of what it means to be hot, if you like, praying always with all supplication for the saints. And as Daniel did, he when he prayed, he kneeled, right? And of course, we've spoken about that in depth, right? How when you pray, you don't stand up with your hands folded like they do in most churches. Um, no, you're on your knees, you look up to heaven, you lift up holy hands with your eyes open towards God, which is how we see the prophets done it throughout the Bible, or well, God's people throughout the Bible. And then we see cold, right? I just put two pictures there of here you see Catholics with their rosary beads, with their hands clasped. And here you see, I, I believe this is the Pentecostal church, and they're speaking in tongues. They're not lukewarm. They're just cold right because they're doing what christ said is just vain repetitions that the heathen do they think they shall be heard for their much speaking so then the question is what is lukewarm when it comes to praying are we only praying once a day or twice a day when clearly the prophet daniel was kneeling three times a day but even more so, in Ephesians, it actually says to pray always with supplication for all saints. Are we praying for all our brothers and sisters? When a brother or a sister in faith says, can you pray for me about this? Are we praying for them? Are we, uh, you know, sometimes this happens to me, and I'm sure it happens to you guys too. Random names will just pop up in your head of random brothers and sisters. Many a times, um, people that you've never actually met in real life, but a lot of us, we know each other 
from being online, right? I believe that when those names pop into our head, it's because the Lord wants us to pray for that person. Um, we might not know even know why at that time, but they might actually be going through that something at that very moment, which is why the Lord's put their sent like an angel to put their name in your mind to pray for them. And when it comes to prayer, although yeah, I would always, uh, well, I would always try to start my prayers on my knees. Let's say if I'm going out there, uh, in I love going out into nature, as I'm sure many of if you guys do, and just talking to him, just telling him about my life sometimes just like a, like i'm talking to a friend and obviously yeah um sometimes and sometimes you might be in the midst or you might be on the train going to work or on the bus going to work or to evangelism and you can't get on your knees in that moment but the lord will hear you if you're praying you can pray in your mind to him and here we see another example of what it means to be hot in john chapter 7 verse 53 and eight one to two so basically 53 verse 53 is the last verse of chapter seven and then it kind it just continues into verse eight so this is all a continuation it says and every man went unto his own house jesus went unto the mount of olives and early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them and of course christ is our pattern right he is our main example he is our lord our shepherd, our master, he, if you see here, he, everyone went to the house, he went to the Mount of Olives, and we all know, well, I'm sure most of us know what he would do at the Mount of Olives, he would pray, right? And then it says, in the morning, he came into the temple. So he, in other words, he spent the whole night on the Mount of Olives praying before going into the temple. And of course, Christ was someone who, you know, he was the son of God who took human flesh upon himself. But even he knew the importance of prayer enough that he had to spend at times hours in prayer. And it's as the spirit leads there. But yeah, and when it comes to prayer, I, I guess it's a case of you can never pray too much. As in, you got, obviously you don't want to spend all your time, you can't spend all your, all your time in prayer because then you know, you also need to do the work, but it's like it goes hand in hand with doing the work and with studying. And so um, here we read in Gospel Workers, Sister White says, if we would refresh others, we must ourselves drink from the fountain that never becomes dry. It is our privilege to become acquainted with the source of our strength, to have hold on the arm of the arm of God. If we would have spiritual life and energy, we must commune with God. We can speak to him of our real wants and our earnest petitions will show that we realize our needs and will do what we can to answer our own prayers. We must obey the injunction of Paul, arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light, Ephesians 5.14. And she goes on to say, Luther was a man of prayer. He worked and prayed as though something must be done and that at once and it was done. His prayers were followed up by venturing something on the promises of God. And through divine aid, he was enabled to shake the vast power of Rome so that in every country, the foundation of the papacy trembled. So Martin Luther was a man who, he actually struggled with a lot of health issues, many different health issues. And Sister White even says in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, when he took his stand in Worms in Germany, before the great men of the earth to stand up for the gospel and to, you know, when he made that speech, here I, here I take my speech, he was in very feeble health. And he was actually made to say the speech twice, once in Latin and once in the uh, Germanic language, I believe. And, but of course, Luther, he, he prayed to the Lord that the Lord would give him strength there and also the courage to do the work that he, that he was to do. But it was a case where, you know, he'll pray for that courage and then he will venture out on it. So then he will go out and preach the truth boldly because he's prayed for it. So, you know, it's the case of, well, I've prayed for it. He's going to give me that boldness. He's going to give me the words to speak. So let me just go and do it. And the Lord will, will do the rest kind of thing. And also when it comes to prayer, if you're like unsure, like you don't even know how to pray, 
that's even something you can talk to God about. You can say to him, how can, how, how, teach me how to pray, you know? And so she says, the spirit of God cooperates with the humble worker who abides in Christ and communes with him. Pray when you are faint hearted. When you are desponding, close the lips firmly to men. Keep all the darkness within, lest you shadow the path of another, but tell it to Jesus. So if you're struggling, if you are having doubts, talk to the Father about it. Because don't be ashamed, because he knows about it anyway. He sees everything we do. He sees every single one of our thoughts. And that actually just reminded me of a preacher I was listening to one night with a brother and sister. We were on here on Discord late, and the, the preacher said, you know, God has seen every single thought you've ever had in your life, and he still loves you. You know, that when I heard that, it kind of hit me. I was like, whoa, I've seen every single thought I've had, and, and he still loves me. But anyway, she goes on to say, ask for humility, wisdom, courage, increase of faith that you may see in his light and rejoice in his love. Only believe and you shall surely see the salvation of God. So clearly we see without a prayer life, our connection to God would easily become powerless. We would, we would, and when we, yeah, when even when we go forth in our life to share the truth with others, there would be no power attending the work because we haven't actually communed with God and had his Holy Spirit abiding in us. And when I look at like the lives of a lot of the reformers, like, um, you know, I think it was John Wesley. He would at least pray for one hour every single day. Martin Luther for three hours. That's an example of being hot. And so here we see when it comes to studying the word of God, it says in 2 Tim Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Acts 17, 10, 11 says, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These, talking about the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So every single day, these Christians in Berea were searching the scriptures to see whether those things that Paul was saying to them were correct or not. They didn't, in other words, they, even though Paul was Paul, right? He's the apostle Paul. He'd seen Jesus. He'd learned at the feet of Christ for three years, he says in, I believe that is in Galatians. Um, yet the Bereans knew that uh, they had to try what this man was saying with the word of God, that his, um, that Paul's, how would you say? His reputation, if you like, shouldn't just make them believe every word he says, that they should test it by God's word. And this is contrasted with the cold state of the churches of today. So the Sunday keeping churches, the churches of the world are cold. They're not even lukewarm because they, they don't study the Bible hardly at all. They don't read the Bible. It's like the picture there. The Bible's gathering dust and, you know, it says, read me because it's not being read. Clearly, it's not being read. And if it is being read, it's not being understood. It's being twisted by wolves. And those Christians are suffering because they, they don't actually study it for themselves daily like the Bereans. So they believe everything the pastor tells them. So then what would be a lukewarm state then? You know, if you read the Bible every other day. The Bible clearly says that um, the Bereans were studying it daily. You know, or once a week or, you know, or you read it to this one day, maybe for like three hours, let's say. But then you think, oh, yeah, because I've read it a lot today. Yeah, I'm just going to go a few days without reading it. And I'll come back on in four days time. No. That is lukewarm. Being cold is not reading the Bible too, or barely reading it or going to a church where they're teaching false doctrine. That's being cold. Being lukewarm is actually having the truth, but refusing to study it. So here we see 
another example of being hot. It says in First John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16, we read, But now they, talking about God's people, desire a better country, that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So those who truly love God will not love this world. They will look to heaven as their home. They will think and meditate upon the return of Jesus Christ and the preaching of Christ and his soon coming will be a blessing to them. Uh, even Christians 2,000 or well, like a thousand years ago, 1,500 years ago, nearly 2,000 years ago, when hearing about the second coming of Christ, they would rejoice, even though at that time it was still afar off. But for us, it's even at the doors, as Christ said. So how much more should we not love the world and love heaven and heavenly things and think about our mansions that we have in heaven that Christ is preparing for us? And we'll need to remember these things and think on these things, especially in the coming days when, if we are faithful, tribulation, persecution, and even martyrdom may come our way. So we see that the churches of the world are not lukewarm. They're cold. When it, they, they watch Netflix. They watch Hollywood movies. They listen to worldly music. And even so-called Christian music is actually worldly, but pretends to be Christian. That's why I put a picture of that Kirk Franklin guy. You know, they play video games like the world. They watch and love sports like the world does. And they see no issue with that. You know, the world, so yeah, the world is baptized into the church, but with no repentance. So but in other words, they're the world anyway. So they're cold. They're not lukewarm. So the world would be a lukewarm state then. Well, do you, you know, do you still, instead of studying the Bible, watch Netflix? television shows or you still play those video games that you know you shouldn't be playing or you waste time watching sports or listening to worldly music which is very soul destroying and damaging and satan knows what he's doing with the music he was the angel of music in heaven and he uses that as a tool to do entrap many many souls and many christians are will be made weak if they are to just you know, listen to the songs of the world. So we are to actually, when it comes to music, we are to listen to songs that are uplifting. And that means also not Christian music that, well, it's pertaining to be Christian, but they're, you know, Christian hip hop or Christian grime, because these are not, these are worldly genres or Christian heavy metal even. You know, when worldly people see Christians doing those things, they actually laugh and mock at the church because they're like, it just looks funny because it's like, how can you, because come on, like hip hop or grime, you know, that's not to do with holiness. Same with heavy metal. You just, it's just that there's an association there. You can't take that which is unholy and put a holy garment over it. If it's unholy, it's unholy. It, either it needs to change completely, as we all do, or it's to just be put away. So, Sister White says in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, The church is not the separate and peculiar people she was when the fires of persecution were kindled against her. How is the gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? I saw that if the church had always retained her holy and peculiar character, the power of the Holy Spirit, which was imparted to the disciples, would be with her. The sick would be healed, devils would be rebuked and cast out, and she would be mighty and a terror to her enemies. And Exodus 19.5 says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, which of course is the Ten Commandments, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So don't be afraid to be a peculiar treasure, because that's what the Lord wants us to be. Don't be ashamed if in your workplace people kind of know you as a, you know, oh, he's or she's peculiar. They're peculiar. They're, they're different. Like one of my colleagues said to me, she's like, you know, I've never met a Christian like you in my life. 
which basically another word she's saying she's never met a person like me in my life but i just took it as a well well praise the lord because clearly then i'm doing something right <laughs> that's how we know you're doing something right if someone would say to you you know you're different and sometimes people can do it in a can even do it in a demeaning way as she didn't mean it in a demeaning way i don't think so but you know but praise the lord if that happens to you because it means that yeah it's clear that you're different if you're a Christian, it should be clear that you're different to the world, basically. That the world should just automatically know, without you even having to preach to them, that the way you dress, the way you eat, the way you speak, the way you smile even, is just different. You're like an alien, in other words. Because, te yeah, we're from, technically we belong in New Jerusalem, but we're here on this earth, of course, our main purpose being to bring other people to that celestial city. And if we fail in that duty, we will fail to enter into those gates of New Jerusalem ourselves. So here we see, and this is linked to worldliness as well, this one. So here we see an example of being hot. It says in 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And how true is this in the last days? That the main sins of this world is those three, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Satan can get most people just with those three, or even just one of them, the lust of the flesh. Look how much that is promoted in society today. It was something, the lust of the flesh, right? That was something that was very prominent in pagan religions, like in Greek pagan religion. Um, if you look at like the Greek statues, they're always naked most of the time. The Greeks were absolutely obsessed with basically fornication. And when the Christian church came in and Christianity started to spread, there was more, obviously the pagans were converting and marriage became a more desirable thing, right? It was The marriage institution was uplifted. And so part of this whole, you know, thing that's happened in the last days is just this whole pagan, it's really, it's just paganism coming back, to be honest, with people really desiring the lust of the flesh and that being promoted in every in almost, well, you go to like on the London Underground and you see some of the advertisements and the way some people are dressed. It's like, yeah, it's crazy. And so in Matthew 5, 8, he said, Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So you, you can't be pure in heart if you, have the, if you have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life as well. That's another one, pride. You, it's, a, it's a sin that in Proverbs, God calls it an abomination. And so here we see that the churches the, of today's world are cold. They're not even lukewarm here. So I got this um, picture from uh, Christianity Today, which says, here's how 770 pastors describe their struggle with porn. So if the pastors in the hundreds, but probably thousands, are struggling with this, what for the congregation? And this was from the religious news service, this quote, where it says, that's the message of good Christian sex. Why chastity isn't the only option and other things the Bible says about sex. A new book by Bromley McLenna, an associate pastor at Union Church outside of Chicago. The book is McLenna's attempt to free Christians from the shame about having premarital or extramarital sex. So clearly the church has gone cold in this, at large is cold here. That they're actually trying to say that they're trying to say that fornication is okay and you see that pastors are struggling when it comes to pornography i mean so they're not even lukewarm but then what would lukewarm be you know do we as sabbath keeping christians in the truth in the bible do we allow these things to beset us and um you know i've in my past i've struggled with some of these things so i know it, for people who do struggle, it can be really hard to overcome. So don't feel defeated. But as we saw in the previous like verses about putting your, just put your trust in Christ, uh, pray, ask him to help to overcome. He will help you. And, um, you know, your, the, the sins that, your sins that are scarlet will be as white as snow. But we are not to have any worldliness upon our garments. We're not to mix with the world in any way. We are to be peculiar. And part of that peculiarity is shunning the world in regards to their love for the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. 
you know, and that also includes, you know, like the flashy cars, winning money and all this stuff. And so here we see another example of hot in Philippians chapter three, verse seven to eight, we read, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And in 1 Timothy 6, 10, we read, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And of course, we see that the churches at large in the world today are not lukewarm. They're definitely not hot. <laughs> They're not lukewarm. They're cold. Yeah. I mean, I just got pictures of Creflo Dollar and uh, Kenneth Copeland, but there's there's loads of these preachers, as you will know. And then I got a picture there of just someone laying in the sun. I, I mean, that's the that's a good state of the churches to, at large, to be honest. They're just there, just relaxing. No, no, no. Don't need to do anything. But we need to be careful that that doesn't actually become us too, you know. And um, when it comes to being lukewarm here, you know, do we cherish? Uh, do we have a love for money in us? Hopefully not. Do we still cling to the things of the world in any way? Do we still, you know, have money as our God? Do we uh, not give our tithe, for example? Or uh, do we, uh, you know, because we love because you love money, do you um, skip back on your offerings to the Lord in the in the free will and love offerings, and instead you will use that money for your own selfish gratification? Yeah, Paul, Paul says that he counted everything done that he may win Christ and that he suffered the loss of all things. Yeah, these preachers are saying that, you know, it's all about um, it's all about money. It's all about big houses and fancy cars and all of that. Silliness, really. For those things will perish away. And so. I got this quote here from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume Four, which actually she she prophesied the cold state of the churches at large in our day. She says the profession of religion has become popular with the world. Rulers, politicians, lawyers, doctors, merchants join the church as a means of securing respect and confidence of society and advancing their own worldly interests. Thus, they seek to cover all their unrighteous transactions under a profession of Christianity. The various religious bodies, reinforced by the wealth and influence of these baptized worldlings, make a still higher bid for popularity and patronage. Splendid churches, embellished in the most extravagant manner, are erected on popular avenues. The worshippers array themselves in costly and fashionable attire. A high salary is paid for a talented minister to entertain and attract the people. Just stopping there reminds me of. Pastor Nicholas, when he called up um, Doug Batchelor, who, if you don't know who Doug Batchelor is, he's like a famous preacher in the Seventh Day Adventist Church who has a 501, I think he has three 501c3s, um, and he preaches false prophecy. And I think he was telling people to get the vaccine as well, if I remember correctly. And uh, Pastor Nicholas, though, when he was younger, I think like around the late 80s, early 90s, he called up Doug Batchelor because um, he wanted some advice because he was wanting to go full time in the ministry. And so he calls up Doug Batchelor and he says, do you have any advice for me? You know, um, I want to go and be a full time minister uh, or do, be full time in the ministry, you know. And um, Doug Batchelor says to him, just keep it entertaining. And obviously, yeah, that was not something you say to a true servant of the Lord, because uh, we know it's not about being entertaining, it's about the cutting truths from the word of God. And so she goes on to say, his sermons must not touch popular sins, but be made smooth and pleasing for fashionable ears. So yeah, you won't see those, you won't even see those preachers preaching against like, um, so quote unquote, like fashionable sins. So, like when I like that source I put up earlier of like how they were trying to some church was trying to say that it's OK. Uh, fornication is OK, you know, and I have seen many other articles as well about. Christians having, you know, fornicating, basically, and uh, watching uh, pornography as well. 
but would the pastors of those churches actually preach against those things because probably not because they're probably watching those things and doing those things behind closed doors in their own lives and so she says thus fashionable sinners are enrolled on the church records and fashionable sins are concealed under a pretense of godliness god looks down upon these apostate bodies and declares them daughters of a harlot to secure the favor and support of the great men of earth they have broken their solemn vows of allegiance and fidelity to the king of heaven and of course that's what the seventh day adventist church is going to do in the future when the sunday law is enforced they are going to go along they're going to also enforce the sunday law it's going to be a little process there but it's clear that that's where that church is heading um currently they are they are the sda church are in a lukewarm state because they're sabbath keepers but they are as we can see from this study they're not actually hot but we as those in the remnant have to be careful that just because we carry the name remnant we we think we're okay with oh uh, yeah i'm rem i'm a, i'm in the remnant church i'm 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 hot i'm on fire but are you actually so and here we see and we're coming to the end of the study of the sermon so it says in acts 13 42 to 45 and when the jews were actually hmm, no i'm gonna i'm gonna go a little bit over um i just realized where we are actually um hopefully not too long um, so in Acts 13, 42 to 45, and when the Jews were going out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those who which uh, which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So here we see that the, obviously the early church, they were keeping the Sabbath day, right? And this is actually a good passage to use on um, people who say that they, um, in Acts, they were only preaching on the Sabbath because the Jews went to the synagogues on the Sabbath. But look in verse 42, the Gentiles asked them if they would preach to them the next Sabbath. Now, if they were, if they held Sunday as a holy day, the Gentiles never would have asked them to preach on Sabbath. The Gentiles would have just said Sunday because the Gentiles wouldn't have had an issue with that. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the pagans actually had Sunday as a the holy day, right? Because it was the day of the sun god. Uh, the Romans called it Mithra. The Phoenicians called him Baal, right? But they, it was like they knew, okay, these guys are Sabbath keepers. But what, what were they doing on the Sabbath day? They were preaching on the Sabbath day. They were getting the message out there to others. And that's something we have to think about that. You know, we're not just here on the Sabbath day, 12.30 to 2, let's say, learning. And then, yeah, it can have a bit of fellowship. That's that's beautiful, you know. It's how beautiful it is for brothers and sisters to dwell in unity together, it says in the Word of God. But, you know, the, what was the early church doing on the Sabbath? They were actually going out there preaching to the multitudes and um, people were being converted. In fact, the whole city came to hear the word of God in that day. So, yeah, this can't be the, the, the churches of the world that are telling people to join them for Sunday service. They're cold. They're not lukewarm. In this regards. So this again, this is for this is for us. Are, are we. Um, having the same zeal of the apostles who are sabbath keepers or are we you know well yeah i'll keep the sabbath i'll go to church on the, on, on sabbath but you know i'm not going to do much else kind of thing which is basically how most how the how the sda church fell so in second chronicles 2020 we read and they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of tekoa and as they went forth jehoshaphat stood and said hear me o judah and the inhabitants of jerusalem Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And First Thessalonians 5.20 says, despise not prophesyings. So this is a state of a church that is hot. A church that will that is on fire for the Lord will believe God's prophets and will not despise prophesyings. But the church at large, we know is cold here, right? Because as I put there, what do many nominal Christians say about the testimonies of Ellen G. White, right? 
And we've all, I'm sure many of us have come across those Christians that have called her a false prophet. And then you ask them, can you give me one false prophecy of Ellen White? And they can't answer you. So it's just this idea that is out there among as many Christians as well have never heard of her, which is better for us when we're talking to them about her. But then they might go online on YouTube and, oh, she's a false prophet. You know, so they don't even take heed to the prophets the Lord has sent. You know, so they're not they're not lukewarm. They're not hot either. They're cold. So then what would lukewarm be in this regards? That would be a people who know that the Lord has sent a prophet. Right. Are convicted by that fact. Read their testimonies, which is the spirit of prophecy, yet do not actually follow the things that are written therein. You know, or do it half heartedly or not to its full extent or do some of the reforms, but not all of them. And that includes when it comes to health reform. You know, I'm like me, for example, I'm trying to scratch up on my sleep because that's part of being healthy, you know. And uh, praise the Lord, he's been helping me there to get to bed before 11, be in bed by 11.30, which is uh, better than what I was doing before. And then perhaps I'll get uh, earlier and earlier. So, here we see an example of being hot in Daniel chapter 1, verses 5 and 12. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. And in all manners of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. So Daniel was a man of God who knew that eating pulse or fruits and vegetables, the diet that God originally gave to mankind in Eden, would be for his benefit. And we see in verse 20 that the time was three years. So Nebuchadnezzar actually gave them three years. And after three years, they come into Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar says uh, he found them 10 times better than all of the magicians in his court who ate the animal flesh. And Sister White says in Testimony to the Church, Volume 9, We do not mark out any precise line to be followed in diet, but we do not say that in countries where there are fruits, grains, and nuts in abundance, flesh food is not the right food for God's people. I have been instructed that flesh food has a tendency to animalize the nature, to rob men and women of that love and sympathy which they should feel for everyone, and to give the lower passions control over the higher powers of the being. If meat eating was ever helpful, it is not safe now. Cancers, tumors, and pulmonary diseases are largely caused by meat eating. And of course, science is now caught up with the prophecies of Ellen G. White and ha will now preach the same thing. And will show the studies to back it up that actually, yeah, the main cause of heart disease and cancer is from eating animal flesh. So clearly the churches of the world are cold in this regards because they don't care about what, you know, trying to follow the example of Daniel. They have old church barbecues after church service on a Sunday to make it even worse. And uh, they'll cook their chicken. And what else do you have on a barbecue, right? Sausages, bacon, right? Uh, things that the Lord himself even calls abominations. So they're not lukewarm in this regard. What would lukewarm be? That would be, you know, actually knowing that you shouldn't be eating meat, but eating meat. Or, you know, maybe you know, maybe once a month or whenever, you know, oh, I want some of that chicken or I want some of that, um, whatever it is that you might be craving. So here we see another example of hot. It says in First Timothy chapter, and I'm, I am sorry that I am going over. I generally don't go this much over, but um, I feel that I feel the need to finish this today rather than come next week into this. So in First Timothy two nine to ten, it says, "In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety." not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. And in Deuteronomy 22, 5, we read, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So I didn't even have to put a quote from Sister White in this one in regards to the dress reform, because the Bible tells us anyway. 
what the Lord would have of us. But if you wanted to look into her writings, and many of us know that she, you know, talks of dress reform and that, you know, men shouldn't dress like a woman and a woman shouldn't dress like a man, and that the women should adorn themselves in modest apparel, as Paul says in First Timothy. Now, we know that the churches of the world are cold in this regard. I mean, that picture there is just a picture of the Hillsong worship team. Hillsong is a church that many of you have heard of. Uh, I went to one of their conferences when I was a teenager, when I was like 16, I think. Um, and you can see in the picture that um, they're dressed like the world, you know. I mean, even the men are like their fashion is, though I couldn't say it's sin, it's kind of, you can see that they're, they're dressing like the world, right? Uh, and look at the women, they're all wearing trousers, uh, makeup, and one of them even has like, is almost bald as a, as a one haircut or two, I don't know. But, and of course the Bible says that the woman should have long hair as a covering. So, and the guy here has like hair below his shoulders. And then of course, like women with braids and which Paul says not to do, and you know, the red lipstick and the, the earrings. So what would lukewarm be? Lukewarm would be knowing what is required of us by the Lord, but you know, maybe you do the dress reform, but every now and again you're like, oh, do you know what? I, I wanna I just wanna put on some trousers today or some jeans. If you're a girl, if you're a girl, of course. Um you know. And so I think, yeah, this is the last, this is the last point, and this is on evangelism. So in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 28, we read, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft of the Jews. Five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. And of course, this is Paul speaking, and that Sister White touches on this in the sketches of the life of Paul that she wrote, that Paul's ministry is not given as in, in the New Testament as a, like a, oh, wow, Paul, he was just a specially blessed guy. And he was, but it's like to look up to him and be like, you know, that, that is uh, someone who is like really on fire and I can't be like that. No, his example is given because that is like given as an example of this is what we should all as Christians strive towards. This is what it really means to be hot is basically the life of Paul and the apostles. And we know if we're going to go forth in the loud cry, we need that same zeal. That zeal that was not there in the SDA church, which is why they did not receive the latter rain in the 1800s. And so in Luke 24, 52 and 50, 53, it says, and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. So here we see the apostles every single day. This is before Pentecost, don't forget. They were preaching about Christ in the temple every day. And then they received the Holy Spirit. And so Sister White says in Spirit Prophecy, Volume 4, the great sin charged against Babylon is that she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of the fornication. This cup of intoxication, which she presents to the world, represents the false doctrines which she has accepted as the result of her unlawful connection with the great ones of the earth. Friendship with the world corrupts her faith, and in her turn, she exerts a corrupting influence upon the world by teaching doctrines which are opposed to the plainest statements of the word of God. So the churches at large, the Sunday keeping churches, they're not even they're not even in the mix, if you like, because they're for one, they're preaching false doctrine, and two, um, they don't many we know most christians don't actually even try and share their faith anyway because even when some of us have gone out there people will have said to us right i think to a couple of brothers that they were like oh wow like this never happens anymore like 
people coming and telling me about Jesus, you know. Jehovah's Witnesses used to do it, but they don't seem to do it anymore. But you guys, they, they said it was like refreshing in a way. Even though they were an unbeliever, I was like, oh, I don't see this anymore kind of thing. Um, and so what would be lukewarm in this then? Lukewarm would be actually, we know the truth, but we're sleeping on it. Uh, lukewarm would be um, knowing that you need to go out there and share the truth with souls, but actually you um, you don't. Like, or, or maybe you do it once a week, let's say. Or you think to yourself, oh, no, I'm good. I'm hot. I'm, I'm on fire for the Lord because I went to that protest and I preached to the people there uh, three weeks ago. Yeah, but it was three weeks ago. What were, the apostles were doing it every single day. And it was, some of them had jobs as well, other jobs that they were doing too. Like Paul had to make tents uh, sometimes, um, as well as preaching daily. And yeah, in Acts 5.42, it says, And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. When it says they ceased not, I mean, they didn't go a day without doing that. But how many of us have gone days, weeks, or even months without sharing our faith to others? Whether that be in our home or to our neighbors or people in our workplace or people on the street. And, you know, you can just, it's not hard. Like you can just get your, the tracts and hand them out if you're, you know, afraid to speak to people. Because even me, that's what I do a lot. Of time. I've been doing quite often recently is just handing out tracts. And if someone wants to talk about it, I'll talk, to, I'll talk to them about it. So lukewarm is actually, you You have the truth. You're a Sabbath keeper. You're doing the work to some extent. But it's not like how the apostles were doing it. And... Okay, let me go... From here, it says, and so in testimonies to Church William 5, she says, All can do something in the work, none will be pronounced guiltless before God unless they have worked earnestly and unselfishly for the salvation of souls. The church should teach the youth, both by precept and example, to be workers for Christ. There are many who complain of their doubts, who lament that they have no assurance of their connection with God. This is often attribute, attrib attributable to the fact that they are doing nothing in God's cause. Let them seek earnestly to help and bless others, and their doubts and despondency will disappear. Not may disappear, will disappear. Um, boy, can I t attest to that in my own walk with the Lord. That going out there and doing the work and trying to save others is just, not only is it um, a blessing in and of itself when you do it, the, your faith is increased. The seeds planted that you are trying to plant will actually help you. And so she says, also, many who profess to be followers of Christ speak and act as though their names were a great honor to the cause of God, while they bear no burdens and win no souls to the truth. Such persons live as though God has no claims upon them. If they continue in this course, they will find at last that they have no claims upon God. Notice how she says they win no souls to the truth. She's not talking about ministers. She's, not talk she's talking about us. She's talking about the, every single person in the church, every brother and sister, every minute man. Every trench builder in the army, not the generals, everyone has to win souls to Christ. And so this is the final quote from Sister White. And again, I apologize for going so long over. I don't usually do this, this these days. But um, yeah. Um, in Gospel Workers, she says, let every worker for Christ make it his highest aim to win souls to God, rather than to be looking at and teaching mere superficial requirements. Direct your energies to the fitting of living stones for the building of God's temple. So our highest aim is to win souls to God. And so just finishing the testimony to Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3 and 18 to 21. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that they may see, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. So I hope and pray that you were blessed by, by what was heard this Sabbath day. If we can all kneel, let's end in prayer. And bow our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the study you gave today. And we pray, Father, that uh, we may attain to that experience and that faith that was actuated by the apostles. Even more so, that was actuated by Christ himself. May we follow his pattern and look towards heaven in our thoughts and have heaven in our affections. Father, if there are any chains that are binding us to the world and to sin, break them from among us, Lord. And may we as brothers and sisters in Christ dwell with the unity and love for one another. May we do those works which please you, Father. Thank you for being so long suffering to us when we have heard when we have not done those things which you would have us to do. And thank you for giving us many opportunities to repent. And we pray, Lord, that we may be zealous and that we may have that same love in dwelling in our hearts that Jesus, ha Jesus Christ has for souls. And we uplift and pray this prayer in the name of your Son, our Saviour, and our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.